speakers on my uh, YouTube and um, sorry pause Uh, what I remember, I'm going to be posting the lectures to the uh, YouTube. Uh, this is uh, for a, a couple of reasons. Uh, it is uh, very definitely, though, not to encourage you not to come to class. Please come to class. Questions get answered more easily in class. Uh, um, uh, yeah, but uh, a lot of the times when I uh, go through programming exercises and stuff, uh, I'll be actually doing them on my machine up here. Right? And by the time you get home, uh, you might have remembered how to start them, but uh, then you get lost. and. Uh, Hearing me talk through them and actually seeing what I'm typing into the system as I do an exercise uh, is often very, very valuable and being able to replicate that and extend it in your own work. Uh, so I am trying really hard, particularly when I come to the programming exercises, to uh, make sure that I uh, do get a recording up there of uh, how to do it. Uh, uh, the other reason that I do this is uh, particularly as we get back in here and it gets colder and turns into flu season and stuff, people are going to get sick. Uh, um, I, I would very much encourage you not to come to class if you get sick. Uh, what I'm recording this on is a uh, video conference software, uh, and uh, if you really need to, uh, either for reasons of illness or if you have to travel for some reason or something like that, uh, you're welcome to log on to the video conference remotely uh, and attend the lecture that way. Uh, now, I don't want to do that uh, for everybody because we do get good questions and it's harder to interrupt and ask a question uh, remotely from the, uh, the video, uh, but uh, if you're in a situation where you just can't drag yourself here for uh, whatever reason, uh, please do let me know and have me send you a link to uh, log on to that video conference. Um, and then the last thing in here uh, is the uh, Slack channel. Um, show of hands, how many of you have used Slack before? Just a couple. Uh, how many of you know what Slack is? Not even one of the ones who've used it. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, so Slack is uh, an instant messenger alternative. Uh, it it uh, has a few things that uh, most instant messengers don't, though. Uh, ability to uh, put files up there, to have uh, some branch conversations, uh, and uh, very interestingly, a bot participate. Uh, and so we're going to write uh, some uh, a, a Slack bots as part of this course that participate in the Slack channel. Uh, but I find it a much more useful mechanism than email uh, for uh, answering questions and things, primarily because when you ask a Slack question, by default, uh, everybody else can see what you're asking. Uh, and if you're confused about something uh, and are speaking up about it, uh, I guarantee you there are three or four other people who are confused about it who aren't speaking up about it. And so for the most part, I'm going to encourage you to ask questions on the Slack channel uh, so I can provide help and other people take advantage of that. Now, of course, if you uh, do want to ask something that uh, uh, you don't want to have everybody see, I don't know if it's your uh, great business idea you want feedback on or if you're just embarrassed to say you don't understand something or something like that, please do feel free to uh, send a direct message to me in Slack. Uh, and you can still do direct one-on-one -on -one conversations there. But for the most part, having that be a conversational forum for everybody in the group is a yeah, good thing for keeping everybody on the same page. Um, so, uh, one of the most important things, and I'll re reinforce this towards the end as well, uh, send me an email, uh, derekj at gmail.com, it's on here. Uh, um, I'm uh, not yet actually able to access the class list, uh, they haven't got me on the right system, so I don't have all your emails. Uh, so I'm going to absolutely depend on you sending me an email uh, to uh, get on that Slack channel. Uh, uh, hopefully I'll uh, sometime in the next day to actually get all your emails and send a uh, mass email out with some of these uh, slides and information. Um, but uh, please, please, please do send me an email, uh, directj at gmail.com. Uh, uh, that's also the way homework submissions will happen. Uh, and uh, the uh, homeworks have to be submitted by the start of class. Uh, they have to be in my email. Uh, um, and uh, so I don't really want you working on them in class. Uh, if you uh, run in without having things be done and uh, I uh, look after class and the email uh, was in my inbox at 610 uh, I, and I noticed you were in a corner screwing, well, that's better than not turning it in at all. But, um, but for the most part, the, uh, the, the deadline is the start of class that I have to have an email from you with your homework attached. Oops. So let's talk about what we're actually doing in here. Uh, uh, today, uh, the uh, main focus uh, is uh, on uh, what happens when you type something into an address bar. Uh, what servers are involved? What's a DNS server? What's a DHCP server? Uh, just what are all the nuts and bolts pieces of uh, the, uh, the internet? Uh, and uh, this is going to be at a fairly low level, a networking level, a level that we're not going to spend a lot of time on the rest of the class, but basically just to uh, lay a foundation for things. Starting next week, uh, we're going to start uh, talking about programming. Uh, and uh, programming is a huge field. Uh, you can uh, uh, talk about this in any number of ways. Uh, we're really going to be talking about it uh, from the uh, perspective of uh, 
what's the, am I doing when I'm starting to program? What's the, a, a, are you telling the machine how to do, and how do you get methodical about telling it how to do? Since the main thing you're going to get in trouble with in programming initially uh, is uh, being too high level. With uh, talking to another person, you can kind of make some assumptions about what they understand. Uh, and uh, with the computer, for the most part, you can't make any of those assumptions. So, um, let me kind of get a show of hand around here of who's done any programming before. Okay. A pretty small number of you again. Yeah. There we go. Uh, what language have you uh, programmed? A bunch? Okay, great, cool. Um, so I find that uh, at this point, the basic programming languages are largely irrelevant. There are some that are higher level languages and some that are lower level languages, uh, but the common denominator really is that you have to uh, uh, you know, really uh, in great detail uh, tell the computer exactly what you want it to do and not make these, uh, yeah, these assumptions. We're gonna be using JavaScript in this course, uh, which uh, is actually not my favorite uh, a, a programming language. I find it very limiting in a lot of ways. Uh, uh, and it's uh, kind of kludgy, uh, but uh, it is what makes the web work. Uh, and so as a uh, web development language, uh, you just have to know JavaScript. Uh, it's also probably, if you're talking about introductory development jobs, uh, the uh, one that uh, you're going to run into most. Uh, so uh, it's a decent place to start. Uh, I've, uh, in previous iterations of this course, actually started with functional programming languages uh, rather than uh, JavaScript. Uh, I love functional programming languages. It's basically a... Uh, a uh, difference between building objects uh, and uh, uh, writing statements about what you want to do uh, in a nice, understandable way. Yeah. Um, but uh, you just don't find them in the actual working world that much. Uh, and so uh, we'll be uh, uh, pretty much exclusively using uh, JavaScript in here. Uh, when we get to project three, there will be an opportunity if you want to uh, yeah, kind of deviate from that a little bit. Uh, um, but you'll have to make a special effort to do that. and won't explicitly be taught in the course. So the third class uh, is uh, really when uh, we uh, introduce, introduce JavaScript in a very deep way. Uh, I actually won't be here that third class. I've got a conference in Boston I'm attending, uh, but I've got a, a couple of uh, developers I know here in town uh, who uh, work in uh, JavaScript all day, every day. Uh, so I'm leaving them uh, some exercises and uh, uh, they're uh, gonna be able to uh, really uh, share some insight as to what it means to uh, be a JavaScript programmer uh, and help you guys with your first JavaScript exercises on that. I guess I should also uh, talk uh, in here about uh, some of the homeworks uh, in here, just give you a flavor of what homework's gonna look like. Uh, so this first one, I'm gonna have you uh, record a bit of a video answering a question. Uh, it's kind of styled as an interview question. I told you that uh, a URL in the address bar question is one of my favorite interview questions. Uh, so I'm gonna ask you to uh, record your answer to that uh, and uh, post it up for me. Uh, doing some of this and some of the group project presentations, uh, uh, in part to uh, yeah, get you uh, practice about talking about these topics. Uh, because again, if you do want to uh, uh, land a job at some point or find a uh, part-time JavaScript developer job here on campus or something, uh, you're going to have to talk about technical topics. Uh, and until you get used to it, it's a really hard thing to do. Uh, and so uh, kind of use this as a fun exercise to start learning how to, about, uh, how to talk about technical topics. The group project presentations will be very much along that same line, presenting your work uh, and giving a pitch of your uh, business idea is an important skill in its own right. Uh, second week, we're going to be uh, comparing some web services, uh, uh, Microsoft Azure, uh, Amazon Web Services, uh, uh, Google uh, uh, yeah, Cloud Compute Platform, uh, uh, IBM uh, Bluemix. Uh, all of these have some different flavors of uh, uh, yeah, things that they can do well and things they can't do well. Uh, and we'll be talking about those some in class, and you've got a homework assignment on some of those. Uh, third week's all about JavaScript, so obviously the homework's a uh, JavaScript homework. Uh, fourth week, we're going to be talking in great depth about Bluemix. Uh, now, uh, I'll kind of say at the outset that uh, Bluemix is not necessarily my favorite uh, web uh, service. Uh, I do most of my work on Amazon Web Services, uh, but uh, AWS, uh, yeah, although it powers uh, probably 60% uh, of the uh, websites out there, uh, is an absolute bugger to get started with. Uh, and uh, yeah, so uh, as I was starting to think about what web servers to teach or sort of what web services to teach for this class, uh, uh, it really wasn't the obvious place to start. Bluemix is kind of neat in that it makes uh, getting started a little bit easier in some ways uh, and still has access to some really interesting services. And all of the web services you can start with uh, have a lot of commonalities. Uh, and so when you learn how to use uh, one well and learn how to deploy an application to the web uh, on one service, uh, you'll have a lot of those fundamentals that allow you to apply it to um, as other web services at different times. Um, also, they're going to uh, introduce some other ways of writing web pages. Uh, a static web page uh, is a uh, web page that doesn't have a, uh, a, a back-end programming environment associated with it. Now, it still has a web server. There's still something that's serving up a web page, and we'll talk in a few minutes about what uh, serving up a web page means. Uh, but uh, what it can do is very much limited uh, by uh, what lands on your computer and runs locally on your computer. 
any web page that you hit is going to have two parts to it. It's going to have a front end, which is that piece that runs on your computer, and a back end, which is that piece that runs on server somewhere else on the internet. A static web page, though, where the only back end is something that hands the pages to your computer to run. I talked a little bit about GitHub uh, as being the place that your developer resume lives. Uh, another thing that GitHub does uh, is allows you to uh, store pages up there uh, and use a service called GitHub Pages to serve these static pages so that people can view them. And it's a really uh, nice place to, for instance, put your uh, resume up because then you have a web page that you can point to that has your resume on it. Uh, uh, whether you're going for a developer job or uh, just showing your computer literate, uh, having an online resume is often a huge benefit. Uh, and uh, we'll talk uh, in uh, this fourth class about how you actually uh, build a uh, web page and deploy it up to uh, GitHub Pages as a static page. We won't be in the fourth class yet deploying something to uh, Bluemix. There's a few more steps <laughs> behind that, uh, uh, but uh, we'll introduce the topic here in class number four. In class number five, we're going to uh, dive down a bit into uh, HTML and CSS. Uh, this is something that uh, used to take up a, a lot more of the course, but uh, I've really kind of learned that it's something that you can learn on your own after a few of the basics. Uh, and uh, so I'm not going to be spending a, a whole lot of time on uh, HTML, CSS exercises. We'll do some of them in here, uh, but I'm uh, uh, yeah, mostly going to be pointing, them to, uh, pointing you to uh, places that you can learn more about this uh, on your own. Uh, and then as we go through the homeworks and the projects, uh, I'm going to be expecting you to have picked up more and more of those pieces from other places to uh, pull into your web pages. So, but the basics of HTML and CSS uh, are just what goes on the page uh, and how that's styled to make it look uh, uh, nice. Uh, and there are a few ways you can do this directly. Yeah, we're going to be talking in class five about HTML and CSS. Uh, and then I think it's class seven, we'll talk about web frameworks, things like Bootstrap, that are uh, shortcuts to writing good HTML and CSS. So, so there's a lot of different layers that you can have involved. Uh, and this is uh, just kind of the first introductory one uh, here in week five. Um, I come from a uh, user interface background. Uh, my actual undergrad major uh, is uh, in psychology. Uh, I uh, got into uh, a computer science uh, kind of through uh, statistical software development. Uh, but all through that, I was uh, pursuing a psychology degree. Uh, and my first job at Microsoft was actually as a uh, usability engineer, uh, so bringing people in in the lab uh, and uh, doing usability tests to see if they could actually use the software that uh, people were writing there. I uh, moved on from there back into programming, uh, but uh, uh, still very near and dear to my heart as to how you write software that real people can use, because uh, there's a lot of software out there that's just inscrutable and stupid. Uh, and uh, really it comes down to having uh, an appropriate design methodology. Uh, and uh, this methodology includes talking to users, it's actually talking to users, uh, uh, not just deciding on an idea and coding it and assuming that they can, uh, yeah, they can see it. Uh, it also uh, depends on a, a lot of these group work practices that I've been uh, yeah, discussing, uh, uh, where you uh, have uh, yeah, people testing your code that aren't you uh, and sharing within a project group uh, uh, yeah, ways of, uh, of working with things. Uh, and so in uh, the sixth class, we're going to be talking about uh, uh, user stories, which are an interesting uh, mechanism uh, to uh, create uh, idealized personas and how they would use your software and use them as a way of thinking about uh, 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 what your software is going to, uh, to do. Uh, how user research happens. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, the methodologies uh, behind the business model canvas and these uh, minimum viable prototypes uh, and how to take this idea of a uh, program, uh, validate it with your, uh, your idealized user, uh, and then look at the business model behind it. Uh, and this process really of starting to build software that uh, is useful to people, usable by people, uh, and uh, may actually make you money. Um, so that's kind of what class six is. Uh, and uh, we won't spend a huge amount of time on the business side of things, uh, but uh, certainly uh, it's a, uh, a big element in, uh, in web development. Um, in class number seven, uh, we're going to be uh, doing one of the two classes that I've uh, styled as a hackathon. What a hackathon is, uh, is uh, a uh, time limited uh, a, a competition, programming competition, basically. Uh, when you attend an external hackathon, uh, it's usually got prizes associated with it and mentors associated with it, and they'll hand you a problem, uh, and you'll form a small team and uh, work on solutions to that uh, problem. Uh, um, what uh, I'm using that term for here in this class is uh, basically a structured working session. Uh, so uh, this one's focused around project two, which is the front end project. Uh, and uh, so uh, you might come in with uh, some good ideas on that project uh, for uh, what you want to do by then. Uh, you'll have been assigned the project a uh, week or two before this. Uh, um, but uh, even if you don't come in with ideas, I'll have some exercises to start with so you as a group can start developing. Uh, and the goal is to make as much development progress in as short a time during those three hours uh, 
uh, to get over any of the roadblocks you might otherwise uh, get hit. Uh, and there are some real uh, arts to uh, you know, working in a hackathon style. Uh, uh, ignoring some of the details and just getting the big problematic areas done is really the goal of a hackathon because you can fill in the details afterwards. Uh, and learning how to uh, ignore what's not right now important. Don't fix that wording. Go on to the next bug that might be uh, a blocking bug. Uh, uh, is a really important part of learning how to do hackathons uh, effectively. Um, outside of uh, an academic environment like this, there's actually a lot of uh, uh, a, a, a monetary reward to hackathons. Some of the hackathons now have $25,000, $30,000 prizes associated with them. Uh, so getting on a good hackathon team or getting good hackathon skills uh, is actually a way a lot of the, uh, the, the really kind of best hacker developers uh, are uh, getting uh, uh, some real money in their bank account. Um, it's not one of my great fortes. I actually take a much more deliberative approach to uh, programming, and so having uh, it all squished into uh, a few hours, or in the case of an external hackathon, a couple of days, uh, uh, it really feels kind of artificial to me. Uh, but uh, boy, it's uh, an interesting skill if, uh, if that's your bent. In class number eight, we're going to uh, start talking about backends and databases. Uh, here, I'll introduce cognitive services uh, and uh, this uh, conversational uh, service that IBM uh, yeah, Bluemix offers. Uh, so here's where we're going to start talking about chatbots, uh, and we'll do this exercise of coding up a uh, Slack chatbot as uh, part of this class. Um, basically, to give a, a bit more idea about that, I've uh, talked about chatbots a couple of times, uh, but uh, a chatbot's just a, uh, an automated system that uh, responds using artificial intelligence uh, to uh, uh, either spoken or, in this case, typed queries. Uh, and so uh, I use a uh, chatbot called Clara for uh, scheduling meetings. Uh, and uh, so uh, if uh, I send out a meeting request to, uh, to eight people, uh, uh, yeah, Clara will actually answer and say, uh, is uh, 2.30 p.m. on Tuesday okay for everybody else? Uh, is, uh, I, I don't see a reply from John. Uh, John, what time are you able to meet? And does all of this back and forth interaction. Uh, so it doesn't take my time. I just kind of uh, put the intention out there, and the chatbot does all of the uh, back and forth talking to make the intention uh, actually turn into a meeting. There's a lot of things you can write chatbots uh, for. Uh, uh, Domino's has a uh, chatbot that plugs into Slack to order pizza, and uh, yeah, so you can put all your topping requests, everything else in your address, and uh, the chatbot does all. Uh, basically, anything that you can think of a human-to-human uh, -human dialogue, uh, yeah, you can uh, create some version of a uh, chatbot for. Now, of course, there are a lot of constraints. Uh, the constraints are that uh, uh, in dialogues, uh, you have uh, either a system initiative where the computer is asking the questions, uh, a user initiative uh, where the uh, user is asking the questions, or a mixed initiative where both people are asking the questions. Uh, and uh, user and mixed initiative dialogues are really hard to build uh, uh, good chatbots for, uh, just because the range of things that you can think to talk about are probably much, much wider than the range of things the chatbot is programmed to uh, be able to listen to. And so we'll mostly be building chatbots that are system initiative chatbots that ask the user questions, get a distinct answer to that question, and come back with another question from it. Um, but within these limitations, uh, we'll be able to do some pretty neat things. So start thinking about what you want your chatbot to, uh, uh, to do. Uh, class 9, we're going to talk about databases. Uh, uh, databases are uh, really the engine that makes the, uh, the web run in a lot of ways. Uh, sources of data and structured ways that you can query uh, are the essence of uh, probably most applications out there. I mean, even social media applications like Facebook, uh, when it comes down to it, uh, it's just a big database. Uh, it's a database of users and what they're saying and what their images are. Uh, and uh, it, uh, out of this database, builds a page that you view. Uh, so you can really think of the database as being the central point that all the uh, software and these distributed web applications come together. Uh, and it's an enormously complex field. Uh, we're going to just barely scratch the surface of it in this class. Uh, but uh, we'll talk about SQL databases. SQL stands for Structured Query Language. Uh, we'll talk about no SQL databases or no SQL databases, uh, which are things like MongoDB. They're basically flat file lists uh, that uh, avoid all that interaction. Uh, and talk about some of the differences about why you might use one or use the other, because they're really good for different tasks. Uh, class 10, we're going to do another hack hackathon. It's going to be a back-end hackathon. So you're going to be doing some exercises, building some back-end pieces that talk to a web server. Uh, class number 11, uh, we're going to be talking about uh, JSON, which is uh, a uh, JavaScript object notation language. Uh, it's basically a structured way of having uh, software talk from one point to another point. Uh, 
and you use JSON a lot in using these web services. Uh, so uh, uh, that's uh, kind of where that's going to uh, to go. Uh, we'll do a little bit of a speech recognition exercise uh, in class 11 there. Uh, I've been uh, building some of those uh, yeah, that I want to see if you guys, uh, all of your voices are able to get the same kind of recognition quality out of IM. And I uh, would love to leave this class with you guys be able to write your own speech recognition applications uh, uh, to tie to those chatbots that we're talking about. It's just a really fun pairing to uh, uh, be able to speak to chatbots. And then class number 12, uh, the pitch day. Uh, I haven't talked too much about projects two and three, but they build on each other. Uh, that uh, project two is the front end uh, for your uh, web business. Uh, project three is the back end for your web business. Uh, the project two presentation is going to uh, be what's called an elevator pitch. Uh, that uh, basically, uh, if you had two minutes uh, in an elevator with somebody, uh, describe your business idea to them. Uh, and uh, maybe show a quick picture of uh, the, uh, the website. Uh, um, that's hard to do in an elevator unless it's on your phone, but uh, we'll actually uh, have a display to point to. Uh, but it's the uh, two-minute pitch of why this is an interesting idea. The uh, uh, final Project 3 presentation is a little bit more than that. Uh, it's the uh, uh, two-minute pitch and how it's altered as you've done the rest of the project. Uh, but really, there I'm going to be asking you to talk about what technical barriers you hit in doing your project, what you learned from a technical basis. Uh, and each of you are going to kind of go off in different directions for Project 3. Uh, so I want to use that as an opportunity to share with the class kind of uh, what problems you hit, what fun things you did, uh, and what other people did in their projects. So, so that's the uh, pitch day at the, uh, the end. Uh, and we're going to focus also on giving useful feedback and useful development feedback uh, in there. That last homework is uh, actually uh, a, 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 a constructive criticism uh, homework in there. You might also, if you're, uh, you're watching closely, have noticed that uh, in the grading uh, yeah, rubric, I had 11 homeworks, and there are 12 homeworks on our module preview. Uh, it's because uh, at least one of these homeworks is going to go horribly, and the class is going to turn into uh, a nightmare, and we won't get to the homework I wanted to assign, and I'll just drop that. Uh, um, or, or alternatively, if they do all work as planned, uh, and this never quite seems to happen, but if they do all work as planned, I'll drop the lowest one. Um, so uh, uh, one way or the other, we'll, uh, we'll drop the most problematic homework out of here, and we'll eventually 11 homeworks included in the grading. Um, I've rambled for 40 minutes now. Uh, I think I'm uh, going to ask uh, for questions about the structure of the course and what we're doing in here, uh, and uh, then we'll take a, a couple minute break and come talk about the uh, first technical topic. Good questions? No? I guess that's all. Oh, hey, cool. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's a great question, and thank you for giving me a chance to uh, repeat this. Uh, that uh, um, this first class is all about the nuts and bolts of the internet, uh, and it's also where all the scariest topics are. Okay? And uh, so, uh, I suspect that most of you have not heard of a uh, DNS server or a DHCP server, uh, or really know any detail what an IP address is. Uh, and uh, yeah, by the end of tonight, uh, you'll have a, a bit of an idea, uh, uh, yeah, but uh, it still probably won't be a complete idea. Um, we're going to be uh, talking about the internet at various levels, uh, and uh, I have uh, quite intentionally uh, put the uh, uh, kind of deepest, most nuts and bolts, hardest to, uh, uh, to grasp pieces uh, first, because as we go on to uh, more and more higher level uh, presentations of how you write for the web, uh, uh, these nuts and bolts are important, but they're not critical. And uh, 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 so it's really not going to be until you run into a problem that you uh, have to think back to these deeper levels and go, oh, what was this? Why is this broken? Uh, and wind your way back down to it. Uh, so uh, yes, by all means, uh, don't don't uh, be at all concerned uh, if uh, some of the terminology I'm using and some of the concepts I'm using are not familiar yet. They should not be yet. Okay, cool. Well, let's take five minutes uh, and uh, then uh, come on back and we'll uh, dive into uh, DNS servers and uh, DHCP. This is just filled with more terms that you might not know. I'll let that loop a couple of times. So you, you, uh, you started with user interface here. Um, that's like kind of what I'm interested in, like user interface, not starting with the psychology. Cool. I'm looking at like a psychology major and like maybe a computer science minor. Yep. So I want to get into user interface and AI. Yep. It's like 
really interesting. It's a really fun area. It, it really is. And it's a route that uh, is a very viable route. Uh, yeah. uh, the miner is really much more important than it was when I went through. But uh, I uh, basically, uh, in the early 90s, uh, there wasn't that much of a computer science major. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, so uh, I didn't need the formal, uh, the formal training in computer science to get in. Now you kind of do need some formal training to get in. Uh, but uh, that site major in computer science monitor. Yeah. Like where, did, where did you go from university? Where did you go first? Um, so I uh, started, uh, I worked my, uh, uh, during university, I worked with uh, uh, MD Anderson uh, in the uh, biostatistics department doing some statistical software development. Uh, but uh, then I uh, did an internship uh, at Compact Computer, uh, and uh, uh, that was all uh, human factor based stuff and uh, software design stuff. Uh, and then I followed my manager at Microsoft and did uh, user visually engineering for about a year and a half there, and then worked on the program management. And uh, then from there back into research, and that uh, was in. Uh, 2006, yeah. I guess I left as a full time employee from Microsoft and uh, then uh, came back here in 2006. How long were you? About a decade. 96 or 2006. It was, yeah. yeah. Did you, just like, did, you, did you go to work on Cortana or anything, or was that too early? A precursor to Cortana. I uh, yeah, wrote uh, the How I Language Model on uh, Windows Vista that uh, was uh, kind of the uh, precursor to what Cortana did. <laughs> Like the, I don't know if they have a, I mean, speech software in Windows 7 today. I remember. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Windows Vista was first introduced. Windows 7 used a lot of my code. Uh, and uh, and uh, Windows 10 was really good. I think it's better than the software. I have like a coach about that. Really cool. It's really neat. Yeah, I worked on the SDK for uh, a long time. And they're right. It's a writing code sample. It's been kind of good. It's a really neat way of getting it. Awesome. Yeah. I'm not sure like, where I want to go with like, uh, my major in mine. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure like what like, um, sort of stuff like um like AI development. I know um, like also virtual reality is really interesting. Uh -huh. Like um, same I did a I did a class in uh, last year that we did a lot of virtual reality like development with the live uh for from Steam and HTC. Cool. Yeah. I thought that was I thought that was like most like the aspects that I've seen, yeah. like, 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 like the lasers and stuff. Yep. They use. Yeah, yeah, no, it's a good way to name on it. I use that the Bible a lot. The Bible and the Bible are so good. Yeah, you're really capable of machines. Like, I was wondering if there's like a way to like integrate like AI like, into the uh, VR. It's like, like, not just like in like the software side, but inside the, the games or whatever, but like maybe like user interface with the, uh, like the system, like AI somehow. Like, figure out. I mean, at some level, I don't know what AI as a general term means anymore, and that all of the uh, user interface approaches are using some intelligent uh, AI, AI, AI processes now, uh, certainly when you get into speech recognition it's a branch of AI, yeah. Um, but uh, even a lot of the uh, game planning and path planning stuff uh, is, is essentially AI at this point. Uh, it's uh, it's going to be the rare piece of software that doesn't get some form of AI going Yeah, like I think most software is going to need AI as we progress forward in time. Oh no, I just realized my battery is running out. Yeah, no, it's, it's definitely uh, going to be a, a, a strange thing not to. So, uh, with some programming background in here, I'm a little bit concerned that uh, we're going to be hitting things that bore the hell out of you for part of the class. Uh, and so uh, I'm going to kind of leave the onus on you uh, to think about how to alleviate that. And, uh, and if you uh, need me to hand you programming assignments that go further than uh, the class assignments and stuff, or that, uh, that push you in some ways, make sure you let me know that. Uh, yeah. I do want to encourage you to think about uh, this class won't build to a minor, um, that uh, it's going to be additional to your minor requirements for the most part. Uh, and uh, you know, that's fine. It's, it's another uh, you've got room for electives and that. It's kind of the next
Okay, great, yeah. And it's also possible uh, to uh, test out a 115 and go into 116. Uh, it, 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 it's sort of, you don't actually need to get the slot, uh, but that's uh, Oops, sorry, restore writing that down. Got it? Okay. <laughs> the main one to write down is that slideshare.net direct JA since those slides are up there. <coughs> the main one to write down is slideshare.net slash direct JA because these slides are up there, of course. Um, so I didn't actually have the sound on in that blue mix video, uh, and uh, so I'm going to kind of complicate matters again by uh, uh, throwing more terms in here. Uh, and uh, again, what I'm doing is piling up all the terms you might have a question about, uh, and then we'll kind of one by one knock them off and uh, give an idea of what they uh, what they are. Uh, what the blue mix video was uh, talking about about is. Uh, Using uh, IBM Bluemix as a service delivery platform or an application delivery platform, uh, and they use some terms in there uh, that uh, I want to identify. Uh, uh, the first is what's an app, uh, and uh, this is a uh, multidimensional term. Some people use it just for a cell phone app. Uh, some people use it for a uh, an app that plugs into another platform, like a social media platform has apps uh, in, in, that run in it. Uh, um, but uh, really, in the way the video used it, it can even be used for a web page. Uh, and so an app is basically just short for application. Uh, it's something that a user interacts with uh, in uh, whatever form. Uh, what's a service? A service is something on the back end that talks to an app. The app is something that the user is looking at. It's kind of equivalent to a front end application. Uh, 
um, the uh, service uh, is feeding data to that, uh, uh, that application. So it might be a database, uh, it might be a uh, chat application, uh, it might be uh, uh, a, a something that's talking to another uh, a device. Uh, the service is a back-end piece. A cloud platform uh, is basically a collection of services. Uh, and so when you get something like IBM Bluemix, uh, they've got a catalog of 100 or so different services you can access. Uh, some of them are uh, AI services that are natural language services. So they might uh, hear how someone talks or types in and turn uh, semantic pieces out of that to tell what they're talking about. Uh, they might be database ser services like a SQL database or a NoSQL database. Uh, uh, they uh, might be uh, a uh, speech recognition service. Uh, uh, they might be a, uh, a, a sales service. So you don't have to worry about how to uh, take credit cards and validate with a bank, but you just tie it up to your application. All of these are examples of uh, backend services that when you tie them all together uh, in a way that work with each other, form a cloud platform. And so that's something that uh, yeah, Bluemix and Azure and AWS and all these other uh, uh, platforms provide uh, is, for instance, a way of doing common authentication to uh, talk to all your cloud services. The way that they make their money uh, is uh, by uh, selling you access to these services, that it's easier for uh, you to pay uh, five dollars a month and uh, thirty-five uh, cents uh, plus three percent per transaction uh, to have credit cards run uh, than it is for you to write credit card code yourself that will run and do that against your bank uh, and take all the security risks of doing that poorly. Yeah, and so uh, when you authenticate once into the uh, cloud platform uh, and tie that to your uh, billing account, uh, then you use all of these catalog of services uh, in a uh, way that makes your application very powerful. But uh, without having to write that yourself and without uh, having to uh, deal with a whole bunch of different service providers for bits and pieces of it. Even as recently as five or six years ago, uh, there weren't these uh, uh, cohesive comprehensive cloud offerings. And so you really do had, uh, did have to go to, uh, a, 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 to five or 10 different individual service providers uh, and have billing accounts with them separately uh, to, uh, to get your app put together. Uh, um, and it's now much more convenient to just have a single uh, provider in through there. Uh, the term API was uh, mentioned in that uh, video. Uh, stands for Application Programming Interface. Uh, basically, it's just a way of talking from one program to another program. Uh, you've got a user interface uh, that is the way that your uh, application talks to your user. Uh, and the way you talk to your service is through an API or an application programming interface. Uh, the way services talk to each other uh, are uh, through APIs. Uh, Basically, you can think of them as a set of, uh, of interfaces is the other uh, term you'll hear uh, thrown around for that. Uh, and well, as we talk about programming, go into more depth on this, but uh, interfaces are generally made up of classes and methods, uh, which are ways of bundling uh, uh, different uh, sets of, uh, of things that you can talk to in the uh, programming languages. But an API or an application programming interface is the most general way of talking about uh, some programming stuff as talking to other programming stuff. And then a Git repository was mentioned in there. Uh, GitHub, uh, I've talked about a couple of times uh, and uh, really only talked to it about it uh, as the uh, place that your code gets stored and as your developer resume. Uh, but it fulfills a uh, much more fundamental role uh, in, uh, in software development than just that. Uh, a Git repository in general, uh, whether it be GitHub or a different Git repository, uh, is a source code repository. And a source code repository is something that wasn't even a concept when uh, I started uh, programming. Uh, and uh, I lost more source code. Uh, I mean, uh, I, uh, shut down badly and uh, a file gets corrupted. Uh, I uh, spilled coffee on my uh, computer once and lost weeks of work. Uh, um, this stuff just gets lost. Uh, what a source code repository does uh, is means that every time you make a, uh, a change, you go ahead and check that into the repository. Uh, and it keeps not just a copy of the binary that you've produced, because you can either compile code uh, or you can have the source code. Uh, it keeps the source code there and all the line by line and character by character changes you made in that uh, version. And so if I do something to mess up my program uh, and realize, uh, oh, this worked, but not since last week. I've made 27 changes since last week. Uh, if you have a source control program like uh, a Git repository, uh, you can go back and look at your 27 check-ins since last week when it worked uh, and uh, you look uh, you character by character at the changes you made in what's called a diff uh, editor. Uh, and that diff can tell you exactly what made the change that made it not work anymore. Uh, so you can go back and trace through where your mistakes came from and when you had a working version. Uh, and uh, it's just revolutionary the way you uh, produce software to be able to, uh, to step back in time this way uh, and uh, in a very detailed way track what it is that you've done.
So source code repositories uh, are uh, absolutely essential to uh, modern uh, development. Uh, and it's something that uh, we're going to actually, after this first class, uh, this first class you don't have to use command line, or sorry, well, actually you have to use command line, but you don't have to use a Git repository. Uh, after this first class, you'll be using uh, a, a Git repository for every single class. Uh, and that's actually how you'll be submitting your homeworks is by sending me a uh, link to your Git repository. So uh, this is something that you'll uh, definitely be really comfortable with by the end of this class. And uh, it uh, might sound uh, imposing right now. It uh, has some scary terms in here. Uh, but in reality, uh, there's only a half a dozen or so commands you need to know uh, in order to make this, all, uh, make this all work. And you'll be really familiar with it by the end. So I'm going to step away from some of these terms for a minute uh, and go through a couple of different levels of a discussion uh, of uh, when you type a URL, which stands for uh, Universal Resource Locator, uh, uh, into uh, the address bar in a browser, what actually happens? And uh, even a URL is an example of terminology that's just pervasive around uh, a, a computer science. Uh, you hear uh, uh, in uh, discussions of the military and stuff, TLAs or three-letter acronyms, which is a uh, three-letter acronym for a three-letter acronym. Uh, um, uh, everything's got a uh, bit of terminology surrounding it. Uh, and uh, so uh, I had to kind of think about what does URL actually stand for, because uh, it doesn't mean anything to me anymore except for something you type into an address bar. Universal Resource Locator uh, uh, it, it is kind of an archaic concept when you could have a uh, a, a, a set of things that uh, you had to describe that way. In actuality, though, uh, what you type in the address bar uh, is, uh, for the purposes of this discussion, just a website. And so you're just pointing to a website. There are, in reality, a bunch of other things you can type into an address bar. You can type a contact in there. You can have a phone number in there. Uh, you can have custom uh, address bar handlers that do different things. Uh, um, but for the purposes of this discussion, uh, I just mean something that starts with HTTP. So HTTP uh, is uh, the uh, uh, address extension that says, I'm looking for a web page. This is something that's uh, uh, looking for an HTML page somewhere. Um, I'm going to, uh, oh, I didn't realize that my little camera thing was even something you were seeing. Let's throw that to the background. No, I guess we can't throw me to the background. There we go. I just don't want to cover up my text. So. Um, before I talk about uh, what happens when you uh, type something into an address bar, I want to give a couple of examples of uh, really what makes everything on the internet possible, which is layers of abstraction. Um, what I mean by layers of abstraction is hiding all of the messy details under multiple, multiple levels of, uh, of stuff. Uh, and so what I'm doing today uh, is kind of at that base level. I'm kicking the stones around on what are the nuts and bolts of the, uh, the internet. Uh, and pretty soon we're going to cover that up with uh, all these other layers that make you not have to think about those nuts and bolts. Uh, until something breaks and you have to think about those nuts and bolts. But let me give you an example drawn out of a uh, more familiar technology about what I mean by this. So when I had a, uh, a, a user interface, had a, a DVD player right uh, here, uh, um, I can think about it as a user interaction level. Uh, if uh, you ask me, how do I use a DVD player? Uh, uh, somehow you've gotten uh, here and never used a DVD player. I'm probably going to describe it as, uh, well, you press play if you want your DVD to play. Press eject if you want to put your DVD uh, in there. Uh, uh, press fast forward if you want to go to another, uh, to another track on the, uh, the DVD. Uh, all of these are very valid ways of describing a DVD player and its function. Uh, but they're all user-oriented ways. Going one level down from that, uh, I, I might uh, start describing uh, well, a DVD player is a, a bunch of electronics inside a, a case with a, 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 a little uh, drawer that slides out. You can slide a, a DVD in. Uh, another perfectly valid way of describing a, a DVD player. Uh, or I could talk about the electronics design. Uh, that uh, Well, a DVD player has an optical pickup that uh, it, it talks, has a light emitting diode picked up by a CCD, uh, and that talks to a, uh, uh, an amplifier. And that amplifier uh, decodes the digital signal uh, uh, and that digital signal uh, is uh, then uh, sent to a, uh, an analog digital converter, and that gets pumped out to your speakers uh, and uh, to your TV. Yeah. That's a valid way of talking about a DVD player. Right? But if you'd ask me, how do I use a DVD player, that would be a totally useless description to you. But as we get down to these lower and lower levels of detail, uh, uh, it gets actually harder and harder to uh, understand what it is you're talking about, because the language gets much, much more specialized. 
I could go even lower than that. I could talk about, uh, well, the ADC uh, converter that's in there, that's actually a chip, uh, and that chip is uh, printed on a silicon wafer. Uh, uh, it's uh, probably a 30 nanometer uh, a, a, a die that's on that silicon wafer, uh, and there are semiconductor transistors that it's, uh, a, a, you don't care about that level. Uh, uh, if you're in a physics class, it might be a uh, even lower level discussion of that, of how do the chemistry and physics of that chip work. Uh, all of these are layers of abstraction uh, that take you from a uh, very, very complicated topic uh, up to a uh, thing that uh, is pretty easy to understand. You slide the DVD in and you push the, uh, uh, the play button and your DVD plays. So, and uh, in uh, physical hardware design, uh, you've only got a few levels. It's pretty easy to uh, talk about this. Uh, um, let's uh, say take a math example. Uh, same thing. Uh, this is uh, probably the only actual equation we're going to see in this course. Uh, um, but uh, you've got a differential equation. To understand that differential equation, uh, I can't really explain what it is until I talk a little bit about calculus. Uh, I can't really talk about calculus until I can talk about geometry. Uh, well, you're probably not going to understand geometry unless you know a little bit about algebra. Um, uh, yeah, underneath that, you've got functions and logic and counting and arithmetic. Uh, there are all these multiple levels that have to build on each other uh, in order to understand that differential equation. We've got exactly the same thing happening in the uh, uh, computer space here. Uh, uh, the uh, difference is, is that to understand the higher levels of these abstractions, you don't necessarily need to know all the nuts and bolts of the lower levels in this picture. And so in this picture, basically this line across here uh, is uh, the uh, level at which I'm going to ask you to be uh, responsible for understanding uh, the details of what it is we're talking about in this course. Now, today I'm mostly talking down here because I want you to have some sense of what goes underneath that line. Uh, and there's lots of fun things that go on underneath that line. Uh, but really, for uh, the purpose of this course and doing well in this course, uh, I need you to understand uh, what back end software uh, databases, uh, things like that are, front end software, UI frameworks. Uh, I need you to be able to think about the user and what their needs are, uh, uh, why you might want to build a website. Uh, all this stuff that uh, really is a, a few levels up from the very detailed nuts and bolts I'm talking about today. But it's important that, uh, that I start with those nuts and bolts because uh, without them, uh, you don't really know what those higher level details are resting on. Uh, and I won't today go about on, on all of those nuts and bolts. I'm not gonna go down to that physics and electronics layer. Uh, I'm really not even gonna go down to the server layer. Uh, although later in the uh, discussion, we will talk a little bit about what component parts make up the computer and the parts that make up this computer on your desk uh, are really the same parts that make up the server. Uh, so I'll uh, implicitly talk a little bit about the server, but uh, uh, the main difference on the server is that instead of having uh, one CPU with uh, four or eight cores in there, uh, I might have 20 CPUs with a total of 256 cores in there. Uh, and uh, a, a hundreds of users on it. Uh, and so it's a matter of scale, and you scale things out to make a server. But it's basically just a computer. Um, I will, though, talk about some of the things that uh, are uh, kind of in these top two layers underneath this, uh, this line. I'm not going to talk about wire protocols and low-level networking firmware and things. Uh, um, I'm going to start by talking about TCP IP uh, and DHCP servers and DNS. Uh, and really just to give you a flavor of what those terms mean and how it is that computers are talking to each other. So that's kind of the uh, first answer uh, of uh, what happens when I type Facebook into the address bar. The simple first version here uh, is that uh, my computer, uh, uh, the browser that I type the uh, facebook.com into the address bar uh, in is going to uh, go talk to its domain name server. And that domain name server uh, is basically a telephone book. Uh, it has all the uh, lists of uh, uh, different website addresses uh, that have ever been asked for from both your computer and all your neighbor's computers, uh, uh, and uh, it ties them down to an IP address. An IP address uh, is a uh, concept that uh, actually has a few different flavors. Uh, uh, we're going to talk mostly about IPv4, or IP version 4 here in this course. Uh, this is the uh, version uh, that has uh, a set of four numbers uh, to define any computer on the internet. Uh, so uh, uh, 192.168.1.128 uh, is uh, an IP address that's usually used as a private IP address granted by your router. Uh, um, but that same set pattern of numbers, uh, four three-digit numbers, uh, uh, can actually define pretty much every uh, address that you could go to from your computer on the external internet. Uh, now, we're running out of IPv4 addresses. Uh, 
as we have things like cell phones or Internet of Things devices or your uh, Nest thermometer or uh, Nest thermostat in your home. Uh, all of these things have IP addresses, uh, and uh, uh, if four uh, sets of three numbers are no longer enough to uh, address all of the, uh, the things in the world. So IPv6 is a uh, advanced at IP addresses that uh, uh, basically has a much, much wider address space. That's all I'm going to say about IPv6 in this class, so we won't actually use that concept anymore in here. Uh, but the domain name server is the thing that uh, takes the address that you type in and turns it into an IP address for you. It's actually going to be uh, using a hierarchy of name servers. Uh, so the first one I talk to might not know about Facebook.com. Uh, it might have to ask another DNS server. Uh, it might have to go ask another one. Uh, uh, but eventually it bounces back up and you get an IP address. Uh, and then your uh, computer uh, can uh, go to that IP address using what's called an HTTP GET request uh, and say, uh, uh, give me a web page. And the Facebook server uh, that you're now talking to by IP address is going to turn around and hand you a web page. Now, this web page uh, doesn't actually have everything on it uh, that uh, you want to get. Uh, it's just basically uh, coming back with a response saying, yes, I have this web page. Uh, it's made up by these component parts. Uh, and then your uh, server is going to go back and say, yeah, OK, thanks for the list of component parts. Uh, uh, and now give me my profile picture. Give me the, uh, yeah, the picture at the top. Give me the Facebook logo. Uh, uh, give me my uh, first news feed item. Give me my second news feed item. Uh, and if you actually look at a stack trace of you asking for uh, uh, the uh, Facebook uh, website, uh, you're probably going to see uh, a, a, a few hundred or a thousand uh, different of these back and forth requests between the server uh, that eventually build up that page. And so uh, this is kind of the uh, first level of detail of uh, what happens when you type a, a, a Facebook.com into the, uh, the address bar. Um, I'm going to actually, because uh, I'm losing my uh, voice here, pop off to a uh, little bit different description of uh, IP addresses and DNS servers and let it fill in some of these details. Assuming I get sound working, which it didn't a moment ago, I don't think. Uh, we have upbeat drum, piano, and drum music. No, we don't. Okay. I might have to stop my screen share before I can actually... Uh... No, that didn't do it. Why is that? Have audio there. Huh. I guess I might have to uh, stop my... Uh... 